Asian syndrome as a result of Buddhist practice. Now, their case is, is extraordinarily interesting because these people come, uh, come to her after serious Buddhist practice, and <coughs> these people uh, have, uh, have often talked to their teachers, and several of their teachers have told them, congratulations, you're enlightened. <laughs> <laughs> and these people feel like shit. <laughs> So this is a really interesting question, right? What's going on? Are these teachers right? And is this really yeah. uh, the aim of Buddhist practice? Or is it the dark night? Or is it <laughs> the dark night? Or is it some kind of uh, psychological background which makes them uh, feel like that? Uh, she's going to publish paper. I haven't had access to her cases. But uh, she, uh, report, she reported about more than 70 people. And some of these people have suffered uh, this depersonalization syndrome uh, for a long time. One person up to 20 years and ongoing. One of the things that I've noticed with people who have practiced and broken down is they get their extreme form of agency whereas they start to think they start to relate their own thought well i got sick it's because i thought this last week i see or the rain falls it's because i was crying yesterday and mm -hmm. so the sense of agency can get expanded okay and in the monastery in england we had two people with this who they shipped off to the mental hospital okay for that. so i'm just mentioning it might be a, an extreme form of agency is also yeah. damage to that sense of self. Uh, maybe in the in the reverse fashion, right? Yeah. Well, it's damage to that sen yes. the sense of agency, where I'm the agent and where I'm not. Yes, yes. yes. One thought okay. that it might okay. Yeah, no, is good. that I don't get any agency. The yes. Other might, yes. Well, everything depends on me. Yeah. Yes. You know my delusions of grandeur. My own well, teachers. My own teacher swore that his sister died in a car crash because of his karma. So I, I would attribute that as mm -hmm. excessive agency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is all what I have to say today. Mm -hmm. It's raising a question. Is uh, this what Buddhism is aiming to do? Yeah, it's how can we understand the difference between uh, 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 realization of no self or this? realization of egolessness and uh, the pathological conditions uh, that seem to happen to people. As far as the minimal self, we need to know the minimal self. Yes. I'm not sure uh, whether they are real. So maybe Will brought to my attention Cotard syndrome. So C-O-T-A-R-D. And hopefully you know how to spell syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> uh, He'd be a tough professor. <laughs> I'm much, I'm much uh, cooler with my skin, you know. <laughs> they pay such a lot of money for kidney. <laughs> <laughs> He, I was given a lousy meal, and, but, but <laughs> it was actually good. <laughs> so uh, I feel a lot freer <laughs> to give people a hard time, uh, which is how actually I was raised in the monastery. You know, yeah. my teacher gave me a really hard time. Good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> to sign a law, right? Uh, you know, teachers, when you first meet them, they're so polite. They say and then so on. And then as you get closer, it's like they, they give you a harder, harder time. And I remember a time when uh, I was in the teaching with a, a teacher, and uh, we were the first one, and all the other ones were late. We were actually perfectly on time, so the teacher started to scold us. If you're not interested, don't come. Why are you late? We were actually on time. And then when the other people came in, the teacher was like, oh, how are you doing? I hope you're well, and so on. So don't worry. <laughs>
<laughs> minimum self, yeah, Cotta syndrome, uh, I don't know if it's really a disruption of the minimum self, but it's, just, it's, uh, it's this weird syndrome in which people uh, report being dead. Yeah, they are, they are dead. Uh, but, they're, but they're still subjects, though. Yeah, I so mean, what I think is really, but they don't have any affectivity. Uh, associated with the subjectivity. So that's what I'm saying. Now, the interesting discussion, if you think of Buddhism, because there is one, uh, there are several uh, realizations to bring here. For example, Niroda Samapati, right? It's a total cessation of any kind of subjectivity. So it's not irrelevant to, to Buddhist practice. Also, uh, in many Mahayana sources, not all, but in many Mahayana sources, the Buddha is describing as having literally no mind. No consciousness, no mind, and is acting spontaneously uh, out of his uh, merits. And yeah, this is in Chandrakirti, in Chandrachita, in many authors. The Buddha is dis they described as having no mind whatsoever, no subjectivity, no. But if he acts, he acts out of subjectivity. No, uh, the, the Mayana sources that I'm talking about describe this as a totally spontaneous act, which is like uh, the, the, the tree, the leaves moving when the wind is blowing, and so on. Okay. No subjectivity no whatsoever. Intent. No yes. intent. They, they've got around this in Bali. They, if you make an action, it's called karma. Karma, right? What yes. people normally think of karma is yeah. actually karma vipaka, results of action. Uh, but action is karma, but in the Pali, they, they have this problem that when you're enlightened, you're no longer affected or making karma, yet you're still making, action. we observe the Buddha making actions. Yes. So what they did was they called it kiriya, which okay. means it's a different word for action. Yeah. And they say problem solved now. <laughs> I <laughs> forgot the Sanskrit term. Tibetan is chile. OK, but, but this is just uh, to put to, for the sake of completeness. Can I just we, can we, I? We, What I really uh, am most interested, what I think is the most interesting is this disruption of the core self and this depersonalization syndrome, because I don't think we need to worry too much. While we're on this one, I might mention there's a number of neurological things where one's range of witness of the minimal self gets reduced. Uh -huh. For example, there is uh, one interest, in fact several, but one interesting case of a woman who cannot spot movement. <coughs> and normally when you look at something, yeah. you know if it's moving or it's not moving. And she can't tell. So she looks at the street, she doesn't know which cars are moving which mm -hmm. aren't. Mm -hmm. And this yes. is part of her witnessing. And she yes. knows that she can no longer see that. Yeah. Uh, another man I have a documentary of, he woke up one day and everything that he looked at seemed to be written in Russian mm -hmm. and he'd lost the ability to read. However, he still had the ability to write and what he did in the end was if he would read something, he could follow it with his finger and then he would know what the letter was. Mm -hmm. And the way he learned to read again in his 50s was he used the tip of his tongue to follow signs and signposts, uh, thereby being able to read it. But these are examples where the range of the witness yes. has actually enormously reduced. Certain, yes. certain areas of it have disappeared. Absolutely. And very often, the people know that that has disappeared. There are other cases where uh, people lose the ability to see things on the left-hand side. Yeah, that's not sure what this is. So if you have a yeah if you have a flower that's a flower and you ask them to draw it what they will draw is this side here and this side they won't see it's not true whether they don't see or they are not able to bring attention to no, what they, they see. they can physically see it that's proven they can yes, physically yes. see it but it will and for example attention. if you if you have a picture like this and on one side it's bur it's a burning house and on the other side it's normal and uh, if you ask them, go there, they will say no. 
Okay. Yeah. Right. So it's not but sure whether it's a problem of awareness or a problem of attention. But yes, there are all these conditions. But, this, but this the point is, the is that. No, 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 no. no, no. This is just. No. The point is here that there are areas <laughs> yes. of your witness. Oh, yes. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. that start to vanish. No, the purpose of Buddhist meditation, from my point of view, is a disruption of the core self. And so my question is, how is that different from pathological disruption of the core self? Right? Do, do you think it then is just partial? Like, I don't know. I'm either, putting that either, out there. <laughs> <laughs> yes? No, I think we're talking about two different things, or at least two different things. One thing that has to do with, you know, whether it's brain chemistry or some problem in the brain you know, that interferes with perception, the sort of things that uh, Oliver Sacks wrote about, the man who thought his wife was a yeah, yeah, okay. like that. And on the other hand, I mean, I've known a number of people over the years who are like, oh, I'm back in my, I don't know who, what I'm doing. I don't know what, what to do with my life. I don't know who I am. I think I better find a guru in India. Or I think I'd better become a Muslim. And, you know, they'll tell me what to do, what to think, you know, and so on. But in Buddhism, it's like, well, just sit there. Yeah, but uh, so people like that who have very, very weak personalities, very, very weak cells, very, very weak sense of self. Because, it's a narrative self. Yeah, it's related uh, to the narrative self. Let me finish. And they're going to they could much more easily flip out because in Buddhism we're not telling them to do this, think that, follow this, and so on. So they're just gonna you know flip out even worse and have just like I don't think it's just a deterioration. People. Of their self. Yeah, I, look, this has to do with narrative self, but I don't want to separate uh, the mind from the brain oh, because, no, pre because presumably related, all these things are instantiated mm -hmm. in the brain, right? So what we are talking about is the many things that can go wrong, the many pathologies that can go wrong in the brain, and there are many, many. Obviously, most of them are not relevant to. Buddhist practice, but depersonalization syndrome uh, does seem to be quite relevant. And the people who suffer from it, from having meditating, uh, complain quite bitterly uh, about that. So the question is, are these just people having like uh, a long, dark night? in the sense of this very negative state which out of which they will finally emerge or maybe they will not emerge or did something actually go wrong in the practice you wanted to ask a question right yeah i was are you familiar with in in zen they have this term called makyo makyo you are vaguely but the makyo means delusions yeah and they're they're or, i mean literally it, like ghosts that arise, okay, you know, and but it's but it's delusions that arise during yes, then you know, okay. then you know, yes, during, yes, during yes. practice, and and they could incorporate all of okay. you know, both of these kinds of things. I mean, that's one thing I've been thinking about. You know, they could okay, be the kinds of delusions that are you know, like yes. it could be personalization, it could be a narrative destruction, or whatever. Yes, and the other one that that comes up often in Zen is. Oh, Zen sickness. And Zen sickness is falling in love with sitting. Okay, that seems a little different. It right? is a little different. Yeah. But, so, but it has but it but it can result yeah. in it can you know because it's somebody who 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 um uh how do I uh, it's like somebody who falls in love with sitting then doesn't want to act in the world. Yes. You know, there's something okay. it becomes a, it comes it becomes a separative act if you're okay. active. Yeah. You know. No, I think you, you're right. You know, the, in the West, uh, nowadays, people have this idea that meditation is some kind of panacea, right? And if you look at traditional, at Buddhist traditions, actually, Buddhist tradition, at least the tradition I'm aware, is quite uh, aware that meditation is difficult and uh, can be quite dangerous, right? It has a lot of risk. And so, we agree on that, right? Uh, and that's a point that is important to make because people have this kind of uh, sugary view of meditation that, you know, 
you get healthy and you get this and uh, your sex will be great. And, <laughs> you know, these things, and, you know, meditation was never meant to be like this. It, it's hard, it's even dangerous, uh, and so, okay, that needs to be on the table, right? What really interests me is uh, how we can make a difference between a healthy disruption of the core cell and the pathological. Uh, can we make this? For example, one of the uh, hypotheses uh, of, uh, of uh, what's her name, will be written in her uh, help, uh, Gerald Lindholm, is that actually one hypothesis is actually that there is no difference, that the only difference is the cultural context, the cultural background of these people, but there is no difference. That's one hypothesis, right? So I am putting this. I don't think that I wouldn't agree with that. I don't either. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure they agree themselves. But the, and, the, and, and the, my teachers have always said to me that you that you know you have to you know that's a delusion. That's clever. yes. You know they're very you know there's 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 clear distinction. Yes, but some of these uh, uh, patients who have been suffering from depersonalization syndrome have gone to teachers who told them. You're enlightened. This is what Buddhism is all about. <laughs> yeah, please. There seems to be one difference. Yogi, yeah. One difference that seems Life quite important. Yes. And that is that one seems to be associated with a bad feeling, like a fearful feeling. Yes. Um, and possibly, although I, I don't know, um, depersonalization, which is moving in the correct direction, as we might say, perhaps doesn't have this. Feeling. So I don't know. Yes. I uh, don't know. Okay. But but I've had this in short spells. Yeah. Um, and it was associated with sometimes with a blissful feeling, but often with an uneasy feeling, uh -huh. which is what you're describing. Yes. Uh, which can become quite intense. Yes. Um, luckily, for me, it goes away again. But um, yeah, I, I can relate to it. So there's a fear feeling with one, and no fear. Sometimes. And blissful, right. yes. And, and it's probably okay to be like that. Yes, in fact, you're not fighting it at all, it's fine. And then on another occasion, it feels abnormal, and there's a sense of knocking down and mm -hmm. fearful feeling yes. about it. So that seems to be a difference. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, in some of the uh, stories uh, around Tsongkhapa, he reports that some of his disciples, when he explained, Emptiness experience precisely the, f the fear. Yeah. So I don't know if the fear is actually. So is it just a question of getting past the fear? Because what is the fear? Is the fear the final loss of the ego? Yeah. Just just throwing it out there. That's is the fear the final loss of the ego? And and in the moments when there is. Let's no use the fear, word core self. Okay. Right? The fear, final fear mm -hmm. of losing the core self. Um, but that's exactly what the is question. The fear? Is and what, what is it when there's no fear? It's fine to be like this. Okay. Yeah. So you think that the enlightened person, whatever that means, whatever right, that means. is without a core self? Um, no, I think they, they have it, but they, they do feel a sense of disassociation. Oops. Yes. Well, there's a book that we, we both read called The Man Who Wasn't There and in which he talks about different maladies of the self, yeah, among yeah, which you've been talking about. Yeah. And the one that strikes me is a whole, he devotes a whole chapter to a man, not unusually, decides that his leg is not, is yes. not part of his yes. body. Yes. And he goes to the extreme of, and there are doctors in Asia that specialize in this, yes. having his leg amputated. Yes. Yes. And he felt like his life had been yes. changed. Yes. He was now the person he always wanted to yes. be. So my question is, and this is the core self. He, yes. his, he had his core self well, had rejected part of his body, this is not mine. Okay. Yes. How do we deconstruct that core self through Buddhist practice? Well, from Buddhist practice, what you learn is uh, to disidentify yourself uh, from to stop to identify with the aggregate. Right. That's the basis of Buddhist practice. That Aggregates being the canvas. Yeah, the canvas. That's what you find the most basic, when you look at the Pali Canon, uh, that's the, certainly one of the most basic teachings in which the Buddha is depicted as saying, 
uh, the self is not the form, the self is not feeling, the self is not perception. And later on, people took it as a kind of metaphysical uh, statement, but actually what the text probably is talking about is simply uh, freeing oneself for identifying with the skanda, with the mind parts or whole of the mind-body complex. Right? So a better solution for the man who had his leg amputated was to come to the realization that he owned nothing of his body complex. No, I don't think the, <laughs> I don't think you can go, I would be very surprised. Uh, look, this is exactly what I'm trying to understand, is what is the, what is Buddhist practice really doing, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, a lot of these things, like when we moved to the Indian Buddhist stuff, we talked a lot about the different types of truth and, uh, and pragmatic truths and whatever. And I think this is a similar kind of thing. If, if the point is to destroy agency, then, then what's the point? Because if you've got no agency, what's the point of any of this? Well, look, this is what Buddhist texts themselves were struggling with. Because, for example, in Mayana, Indian Mayana texts, the Buddha is often described as having no agency. So he's described as basically a star who spontaneously generates uh, teachings. And so the Indian Buddhists themselves, I think, were struggling with this notion of agency, whether the enlightened person has agency or not, which is what I was asking you yeah. to help me, yeah. uh, because I don't know. This yeah. is really, this is what I'm trying to, I think is interesting, is trying to match the pronouncement of Buddhism about what the practice is and what it is aiming at, and trying to see how does it work when you plug in this uh, cognitive scientific category, does it work, does it not work? How do, yes? Doesn't Willoughby also mention, if I can recall, that part of cultural practice had to do with the wider sense of the individual self in the East and West? See, I, I thought she mentioned something along well, the lines. Well, here, here is, 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 is one question, I think. Does she has a number of Westerners, I think they're all Westerners, but maybe they could be Asians living in America, so I'm not sure. But they're all living in America, and these people have these experiences, right? What I was asking, what I am wondering is whether people who come from a more traditional background, does that happen also or no? I don't know. Or do they think it's a problem? Uh, exactly. <laughs> Do they think it's a problem? Or maybe, you know, one of the uh, characteristics of uh, Western modern culture, American culture in particular, is extreme individualism, right? And so people who have much less of a connection to other people uh, tend to be, might be, unmoored much more easily than people who have a sense of being deeply rooted in a in a context, in a family, in a, in a group, and so on, which is what uh, is the experience, I would assume, of most people living in a more traditional society. I have no idea. Or is it a question of cultural background? I don't know. Yes? Uh, in the 60s, we saw many, many people that were going through difficulties with psychedelics. Yes. And um, this is one of the core. Robert Persick. Hmm. Robert Persick? Okay. No. Well, that's what he had. He had to break down himself first. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, what we saw working directly with people that were in this depersonalization process was that they could go into the fear, and if, if you allowed them to move into the fear and gave them a where it was okay to do that, they would come through the other side and often have a transformative experience which often lasted for their whole lives. Mm -hmm. The other side of it is that people would come in and if they, if they went to one of the other hospitals, they would get diagnosed as depersonalized and they would be in what appeared to me at least as a jhana or you know, whatever you want to call an altered state, but they were in extreme bliss. I see. They certainly weren't having any problems. And yeah. They had a lot more information and insight into being a human being 
mm -hmm. than most of us doctors sitting around. <laughs> yes? I think that is one way to understand that. The, the people who suffer from depersonalization in general are the people who report very unpleasant experience, right? Fear and uh, uh, even terrors and so on. People who are blessed, I think, uh, I, I'm not sure how many would report depersonalization. Well, that's, that's a Western terminology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, yeah. It's a pathological terminology. That's the point. You look yes. at Maslow and what he, he was looking at healthy people that were having yes. depersonalization, although they would call it bliss or their ecstasy. Yeah. Well, but uh, it's not just a question of whether it's pleasant or unpleasant, right? Because uh, in the example of the student of Tsongkhapa, he had this experience of a terrified state of losing himself, right? So I think it's quite intriguing to know which one is pathological or which one is well, not. And when or you maybe about pursuing it further, yes. as you mentioned, going into the, the and coming out the other side, is that just that the process is not complete? Yes. Uh, Susan Siegel is an example because in her book she depicts how she managed to overcome. Okay. But the fear returned later time, yeah. and she was diagnosed with brain tumor oh, and died. So so we were and we don't know to which extent what she experienced obviously is related to relating to the tumor or not, right? So it's a really interesting but very sad case. The thing we were talking about earlier before you arrived was the spiritual tradition of St. Teresa of Avila and St. John of the Cross. And St. John of the Cross kind of mapped the spiritual transformation in the book Ascent of Mount Carmel, uh, which is a fabulous book but very heavy and that's harder than Josie's book to read. And he talked about, that was funny, you haven't read his book. Right? <laughs> if you'd read his book, you would have got what I meant. My book Saint John of the Cross talked about these, uh, whenever you had a spiritual transformation, first of all, you would go through trials, yeah. which were the dark night of the senses, the dark night of thinking, the yeah. dark night of memory. It's without the cake, right? Yeah. You said with a cake. With no, <laughs> this is with a cake, but he's... St. John did. Start again. St. <laughs> John of the Cross talked about when you have a spiritual transformation, that you first of all go through trials of the dark night of the senses, withdrawing from the senses, dark night of the thinking, dark night of the memory, which your narrative self must go, and finally dark night of the soul, which is his famous book. So these dark nights are what you go through. And while you're going through these dark nights, you will get certain periods of consolation, uh, which was God saying, keep going, you're doing okay. And on the other side of each of these consolations was a step into union. And when you've taken all the steps into union with God, you finally get to identity with God, which even in the Carmelite tradition, it's, this one is uh, actually questioned. Um, so he has this, I this idea that you have to go through these process. states first, mm -hmm. and you come through the other side, like you were saying. In Burma, they have the, uh, how many stages of insight? Is it 16 stages of insight, jnana? And each stage of insight, I think there were 16, you're supposed to have a, a reaching or an attaining, and then a setting. So first of all, you will attain to a new state <coughs> or a new understanding, but it's unstable. Mm -hmm. And then after a while, you have a period of setting where that period, that thing that you've attained to, become settled in your psyche and you're ready to go to the next level the of insight. Presumably disappears at that point. So these are the particular stages of jnana or knowledges that you receive. But these are knowledges, not wisdom. These are specific mm -hmm. steps mm -hmm. of knowledge that you get. Yeah. So that again would suggest a kind of reaching and then a working it out and then a settling in. Any? Yes? Well, it, it seems like your tr tripartite model of the self mm -hmm. is natural and necessary for human beings. Uh, sorry. Okay. Which makes me begin to wonder, well, what is it about the Buddhist tradition that wants 
this or part of this self to be deconstructed? Well, because this self, no, you're right, actually. Uh, the self is doing a lot of things for us, right? That is, it's allowing us, the core self is important. Without the core self, it's hard to understand agency and so on, right? So all these different levels of the self are obviously important, but they bind us to suffering, right? That's the dr tragedy of being a human being, right? We are selves, so we are trying to be selves in a reality in which is constantly changing and therefore constantly threatening and finally undermining this project we engage in. That's Dukkha. By the way, I'm perfectly comfortable talking about Dukkha and suffering because I think uh, Buddhism has, in a way, a tragic view of human life. Mm. Obviously, there is the other side, but Buddh the Pal Buddha is quoted in Palikan and saying, I teach one thing, Dukkha, and the end of Dukkha. So they are both sides. But I think uh, I, I don't like when people kind of, uh, kind of sh sugarcoat the notion of Dukkha, because I think it's a deeply existential uh, notion of the tragedy of being uh, sentient beings, not just a human being, but sentient being who has to die uh, very soon. And so that sense of the tragic dimension of life is comes from the project of being uh, trying to be a self, right? So In the changing world. So to escape from suffering, mm -hmm. We must destroy well, this self to some extent. To be free. To be free of suffering, we, we, must, we must deconstruct be, or destroy. We must be free self. from the core self, right? What that means, that's what I'm trying to explore today. Free from grasping the core self, yeah. not free of the core self. Free from well, grasping. maybe. I, I think Buddhists no. test themselves struggle with that. That notion of what it means to be free from the self. Does it mean the, you know, one text talk about, well, sometime I play with, uh, what's it called? It's a Zen text, actually. Sometime I play, uh, I forgot how it goes, but it gives a sense that sometime I play, I play with myself and sometime not. Is that what being free from the self means? Or does it mean, is it? totally destroyed? I don't know. That's precisely the question I'm raising. And interestingly enough, I find echoes of this question in very old traditional Buddhist texts, Indian Buddhist texts, which seem to be struggling precisely with the notion of agency. What kind of agency does the enlightened being uh, have? I'm just a shot in the dark, but I mean, is, is he coming from the place of say union in this case, the place of um, the source of the self or the minimal self, it's like coming out. There's no need for all the filtering perhaps at that point. Uh, maybe. Maybe. The nature of self, yes. at least from a Mahayana perspective, okay. has that capacity. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's one it. version of the Mahayana because actually yes. if you look at Chandrakita and uh, Chandrakita, they have the Buddha as a complete stone and Actions, salvific action, are just generated By. out of his, of his out of his merit and his out of merit. yes. There is a and the, the comparison is the uh, the wind blowing through the leaves. The leaves are moved, but they have no intention of being moved. So you have a lot of texts which talk oh, about that. You have a, a lot of other texts which talk about the Buddha as having intention and being something like a minimal self who is unbounded and is acting out of his compassion, right? Yes, you have both versions. Um, conditioning. Uh, getting rid of conditioning. Mm -hmm. Isn't that closely related to getting rid of suffering, that reaction that you have, automatic did, reactions? Did you hear that? He's saying that conditioning 
And your automatic reaction is this part of getting rid of self? Well, it depends what you mean by uh, conditioning, because there are a lot of conditionings which are very important for survival. Uh, yeah, I mean yes. the negative psychological <laughs> conditions. So, for example, what you could mean in terms of uh, uh, basic Buddhist teaching is the conditioning we have with identifying with our mind-body complex, right? That's absolutely. As as that's a conditioning which is precisely the basis of suffering. But then there are a lot of conditioning which are very important, right? Because our mind needs to have kind of uh, ready-made routine to interpret what's going on in the world, and without that, we would be or dead. skills. Uh, not just skills, kind of uh, uh, biases. Well, it's like the veneer, right? It's a whole set of conditions that you have to... Yeah, these are rules. That the monks have to... Yeah, these rules. Yeah. 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 So, so these, so these issues have been written about and experienced for thousands of years. What are you trying to achieve now? Well, I'm trying to actually. Sorry, one thing. He said these things because they didn't hear it. Yeah, yeah, please, please, please. He said, we have the whole afternoon here, no problem. <laughs> Take your time. Okay. The only thing that I That's cannot sit, now. I cannot <laughs> sit because somebody took my chair. Okay, I'm kidding. Uh, what was the question now? You might say. These issues have been. Okay. and experience for thousands of years, what are we trying to achieve today? Well, so the question is that these conditions have been uh, thought about for thousands of years, so what is our intent today? Okay, uh, good question. Uh, actually, one of my complaints is that uh, uh, Buddhism actually has very little this, what I would call phenomenological description of enlightenment. Uh, you, you would think that Buddhism, which is about enlightenment, has a lot of... Uh, but no, what they have description is suffering, the cause of suffering. They're great, I mean, you know. But... Because you can't. Well, why yeah, you maybe there are... There are good you reasons, reasons why you, do, uh, you have no such description. One reason is that the goal of Buddhism is to help to help people to practice. And if you provide description, it's very dangerous that people are going to kind of mimic this description. And so it's important not to have uh, uh, this. But in terms of how we understand Buddhist practice as it relates to uh, modern concepts of uh, cognitive science, that's something that I find uh, distressing because it would be interesting to have more phenomenology of what it means, how it feels to be enlightened, right? That would be great. We don't. We have just fragments in small in texts, very small fragments. A lot among uh, a, a lot of texts, you find little things here and there, but actually uh, relatively few. What I am trying to do, uh, and maybe you think the project might be illegitimate, and that's okay, is I am trying to see to to see what Buddhism is talking about as it relates to modern concept about psychology or cognitive science. And you may say, well, you should keep the two separate. Uh, I personally don't think so, because uh, if Buddhism is uh, able to uh, transform our mind, it should, that transformation should be understandable to people who study the mind, and that's what I think is interesting now in something like the Mind and Life Project, which is start to bring together people who do uh, psychology, brain science, and people who practice meditation and try to see what all that means and so on. Now, it should be clear that there, this has a very long way to go. Uh, this is just one shot at trying to think uh, about this kind of project, and there is a lot more to do, and today I really have no answer. I just have questions. Right? Yes. Would you say, John? I mean, I'm, I'm kind of following up on this conversation here that the way Buddhism is being taught in the West demands this inclusion, and I'm, I'm sort of 
following up on what Andrew Thompson has recently been saying to you, but how do you bring this together into the TTs? Okay. Does that make sense? So I'm kind of, you know, I, having been a former monk, <laughs> does that, that make sense? Because I have the same kind of question, but from a different angle. Right. And that is, as I was going to mention that Thai monks and Buddhism would have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do, so it's not a personal criticism. No, no, no. They would have no idea what that is. And if you ask them, well, what is Buddhism? They all say, well, they quote the Dhammapada and say, a man who makes canals, he digs a straight trench. A man who makes arrows, he straightens the wood to make arrows. A man who develops the path, straightens himself. They would also talk about it in terms of developing the parameter, yes. or developing certain qualities. So Thai monks would not have any idea of this. They would be completely focused on developing certain qualities of self, mm -hmm. rather than deconstructing it. So I think that follows on. Is that true? No, I cannot imagine many of the categories. I mean, these are cognitive scientific categories, right. but the idea of understanding which sense of self is a target of Buddhist practice is a question that you find in Gelugpa literature on and on. So uh, it's not just me as a modern Buddhist, it's also me as a Tibetan Buddhist uh, who is raising that question. But uh, yeah, I think uh, as Buddhism integrates to Western to modern Western culture, I think it is going to change. Uh, the question is how it's going to change. And I think there is, uh, you could say that on one side, there is probably going to be a certain amount of impoverishment. But on the other side, there might be also some new interesting development. And I think one of the interesting development is to try this connection that can be made with uh, psychology or with uh, cognitive science. And that kind of connection also happens in the practice of people, because in the West, a lot of people in America, because this is really what I know, in America, uh, a lot of people are trying to bring psychotherapy and Buddhist practice together, not that they are the same. But maybe there is some interesting combination to be gotten here. So, uh, yeah, maybe. Are yes? You, are you going to mention the jhanas here? Not really. Okay. Hmm. Well, is this phenomenon, this personalization, only occurring to Westerners? <laughs> That's my question. And is there any evidence and knowledge of time on? I don't know. Are you putting out like this? Yes. Because that would bring up the question also of, be a very radical shift for someone who's been brought up to be a Catholic, a devout Catholic, or a devout Jew, or the lives of suddenly they're in Buddhism or in Hinduism, and mm -hmm. that's a big shift. That could play into it too. That could be. Or a person who, uh, there is this question of the connection that we have to other people, the fact that we live in a hyper-individualized uh, society, particularly in America, where this study is actually happening, right? I have no idea. I, I have to, these are my questions. This is why today I am saying I don't have any answer. This is a bunch of questions that I am uh, uh, putting on the floor. And I hope that these questions are. But Ajahn Pandit lives in a Thai monastery. Do you see this sort of thing happening there too? No, the Thai would never ever have any idea of they wouldn't have any idea of deconstructing itself. Practice is about developing qualities. So it's a cultural thing. Maybe. Maybe. So it's adding, not subtracting. I would think people who are, who are... Well, yeah, what ultimate goal? I mean, they, they would very much say the Buddha is an agent and he has actions. And, yeah. Um, I would think that people who come out of a much more stable society, are probably less likely to be depersonalized. That would be one hypothesis, but I have no idea well, whatsoever. Well, they feel it, but it seems to be normal within the context of the development of Dharma. That's an either hypothesis, that maybe this is actually normal, it's and it's just that these people are in the wrong context, they're in the West, yeah, which is the 
hyperactive society. Yes. Yes, there are. You know, kinds yes, there are. Of, uh, yes. Yes. No, this is what I said. But my category are not alien at all to Tibetan Buddhism. Absolutely. Well, I, mean, I mean, in terms of the pathologies. I, I, I haven't heard a systematic treatment of uh, that in Tibetan sources, but I know that there are, you know. But don't they speak about, you know, like when I was talking about uh, Makyo and Zen sickness, you know, don't they have those kinds of things? In they, I don't think they have exactly the same concept, no. But there is this, the awareness that uh, things can go wrong, but I haven't seen any systematic treatment of that in Tibetan sources, but I... But there is a sense that things can go wrong. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So I would suspect that absolutely. the kinds of things that, that go wrong, these kinds of things you're talking about, are, mm -hmm. are, are, to me, it doesn't sound um, cultural, it sounds human. Isn't okay, it? I don't know. I'm yeah. Isn't one of Britain's hypothesis hypotheses that, though, that the, a lot of the people maybe that you're talking about are people that have learned meditation outside a religious tradition. They're learning because more and more the oh, meditation and yeah. meditation in the West is sort of a religious meditation. It's I don't know. Yeah, I have no idea what she would say. Certainly, I don't want to represent her. Uh, I don't know. Are you still a Buddhist? Yes, I'm still a Buddhist. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'm just thinking because if our egolessness is synonymous to depersonalization, uh, but it does seem. The, remember the title of my talk. It's a question mark. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't see why anyone would want to pursue Buddhism. Yes, that's a question yeah, mark. There must be negative <laughs> consequences, and we already have a lot of problems in our social reality. Yes. Now you want to introduce more esoteric challenges. It, it, to, to free oneself from uh, to, to free oneself from this compunction to identify with the body-mind complex is not a small effect. That's for sure. That's why it's a question mark. Don't forget that. Uh, Dr. George, I you, to you, you have to speak. So I wanted to know, how do you feel about this uh, kind of being rooted in thought teaching? Or the what? How, how do you feel about a lot of this problem, uh, the problem of depersonalization through Buddhism, being rooted in a flawed teaching or a flawed teacher or a flawed practice? Uh, there's a lot of research in the West going on now for the very vague term of mindfulness meditation being actually like a uh, very powerful and a strong treatment for a lot of personality disorders yes. um, and things like that. So, and Pante just mentioned that this is not something that, that Thai Buddhism would, uh, would understand or relate to. Can this be a misinterpretation of, uh, of Buddhism by Westerners? Well, uh, I don't know. Uh, one hypothesis, obviously, that is, could be, should be on the table is that these people who suffer from depersonalization didn't practice correctly. That would be one hypothesis, right? I personally don't think so, but you know, I really don't know. As far as the mindfulness meditation, I don't want to go into that because this is a huge chapter and we should have a special uh, uh, session about what is wrong with <laughs> mindfulness. But, <laughs> and this is, there are many books talking about that. Yeah, no, I think, <laughs> in a way, that's what I was talking about. The fact that a lot of people in the West think of meditation as a kind of panacea which is going to fix everything. Uh, I think that's a really dangerous idea. On the other hand, you know, Buddhism change, and so if mindfulness treatments are useful uh, within certain contexts, why not? So I think there are two sides. But certainly, uh, meditating is not, uh, yeah, I mean, in, in, in Tibetan context, I don't know in Thai context, but in Tibetan context, uh, monks understand that meditation is serious business, which uh, can go wrong. Right? So. Uh, this is not, uh, this is deep s dealing with deep aspect of our personality and therefore it's, 
Yeah, it's not to be uh, uh, brought into lunch. Yet. In a way, Buddhism could be called a disruptive technology. Language of business. Yes, but I, I like what you're doing because. What's that? I like what you're doing. Oh, I thought you didn't uh, like it. <laughs> <laughs> you reassured me because, you, you know, I, I, I want to be liked. <laughs> but I'm not giving you validation. But I don't, I don't tweet at night. <laughs> but is that religious marketers often present their religious ontology as a panacea, yes. a positive thing, but you're like showing that it can't go wrong. And, yes. and I think if you give our people the pros and the cons, they can make a decision. I think most people are going to, you know, opt for a more sensible approach to our what? finding the authentic self. Okay, uh, I don't know what the most. What you're talking, not talking. What, what the most sense? sense. <laughs> no, but I think you're right. And what the, what I am uh, disturbed, or what I uh, is that when you know I was trained and raised in a more traditional context, and where people are deeply aware of these problems. So, and then when you hear uh, how meditation is sometimes presented in the West, you see this as this kind of. Wonderful, your La -la yeah, your life will be so much better. You will have better relation. You will have better sex and better success at work and so on. And that's obviously uh, not the way I was educated. Have you did you see? <laughs> What's that? Have you did it wrong? Did you get all that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's my problem, right? Did you? Did you see uh, like people come and do meditation that's about the tradition and go off rails? Yes, but I, I I've seen a Tibetan go off rails, but I don't know what happened to him to them because they wouldn't talk about it. So, for example, one student of my teacher uh, actually went into this. You know, we're talking about serious retreats, right? Not. 10, 15 minutes twice a day or something like that. We're talking about people yes. really going into serious retreat. And one of my uh, uh, main students of my teacher went into retreat, and after three years, he had to come back. He would never say what happened. But uh, uh, in general, people coming out of a tradition, in, in the Tibetan context, uh, people are very unwilling to talk about the experiences. I don't know about types, but uh, Tibetan? very unwilling to talk about what the experience. I remember going with a bunch of scientists to interview some meditators, and one or two would really open about what happened to them, but this is not something that people are inclined to do in Tibetan. One of the things you mentioned earlier was the reliance on the tradition. And when the Buddha taught Dharma, people forget he was also actually teaching a vinaya with the monks and ways that the monks live which was a highly structured form. Yeah. And that form, according to the Buddha, he said that, well, when people come in that aren't going to uh, <laughs> behave rightly or understand rightly, they get washed out of the Sangha like a dead corpse is thrown in the ocean, and the ocean will wash it back up on the shore. So there was an idea that it's by staying within that form that you stay safe. Mm -hmm. And many people... You know, you're all interested in enlightenment, but you're not interested in any renunciation or going without your dinner on a retreat and things like yeah. that. This form, the Sangha, was a big part of the tradition that kept you safe. Uh, you talk about that in your one of your books, right? Yes, the more the readable one, one. The more readable one. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, last yes. question, and we're, uh, and we're wrapping up, 3.30, so... Yeah, I think it's a misnomer to look at meditation in terms of people going off the rails. I've seen a lot of people go off the rails, and looking at those people psychologically, they were already predisposed, yeah, pre uh, predisposed to going off, and <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's very clear. You get a lot of nuts come to do meditation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so to look at meditation <laughs> as a cause, uh, well, I don't know about that because one of the what the Willoughby Britain reports is that among all the cases she observed, she didn't see any patterns. 
in terms of precondition or not. Some, for example, uh, some were abused, some were not abused, some seem to have uh, predisposed uh, psychologically, some seem to have no. So it's very hard to know. It's like a reverse halo. Like you have just studied people that are coming to see you and tell you about their problems. Yes. That's, yeah, that's not a very clear study, is it? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Okay, I think okay. we're about done. I might uh, just finish on a note that my own teacher said to us one, because they teach a lot of these psychic powers and things in the temple of country. And one person came and was seeing Naga Serpent that lived in the temple and got very frightened and uh, got very angry with the abbot and left in an unhappy state. And so somebody said to my abbot, uh, you know, we failed. And my abbot said, yes, but his story isn't over yet. So, good okay. point to yes. finish on. Yeah. Thank you, George, as always. Very good. Thank you. Those of you who would like to contribute to George's very expensive cappuccino fund, <laughs> the nation box uh, just outside here, which we will use for that purpose. Uh, thank you all for coming. If some of the guys who are here, as the, as the people filter out, if you could help me with some of the chairs. There's no rush, but the people who are here at the end, if you could help me shift some of the chairs and the furniture back, uh, it would be very much appreciated. And don't forget meditation here on Mondays. We promise you won't go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Qigong on Thursdays and a oh. uh, special event. Zen Club next Sunday. Zen Club on Saturday. Sunday. 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 It's a movie, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Oh, what's